Good morning, everyone. Looks like we have a birthday boy here in the front row, so we just want to say happy birthday to Carter. Happy birthday, kid. <laughs> so good morning, everyone. Um, when we're worshiping today, let's envision we're in heaven worshiping our Lord because praise and worship is going to happen when we're in heaven with him. So if we just like just really just relax and uh, envision us in the presence of the Lord. How great is that? So please stand for worship.
Father God, you are great. You are the King of kings, the Lord of lords. No one is higher than you, Lord. And you are the reason why we're here. So God, we just ask and pray for all those in, for all of us here in this room and in the city if, that there's hearts changed today and lives renewed and that you are invited into the, all of our hearts all the time. So Father, for all these things, we ask and pray in Jesus' name. Amen.
I love in this next song how that we that uh, we sing about and we pour out our praise to you only, to you only, Lord. None of the other things out there, but it's really about him and praising him. Not our phones, not our possessions, our belongings, but it's about him.
Lord Jesus, wow. We sing these songs to you this morning, and we're reminded again that it is because of you that we get to stand and sit in this place. It's because of you that we experience grace. It's because of you that we understand what it is to have a relationship that doesn't change. What I mean by that is you never change. You want us to change, but you never change. Thank you, Father, today that uh, through your son, Jesus, we get to experience all this. But we know you even want more for us. Just like the song we sang, it's you that gives us breath and life. It's you that give us hope. It's you that gives us an eternal perspective. So, Father, today I just pray that no matter where we've been this last week, whatever has happened in our lives, that we feel a little bit better about the fact that even if things are out of control, you're still in control. So we lay those things at the altar, and we physically maybe don't have an altar in this sanctuary, but we know that that means we lay things before you in prayer and in faith, and we give those things to you. So you know our needs. You know the things that are going on in our lives, things that are physical, maybe health issues. Maybe it's things going on in our families. Maybe it's things going on in our hearts. Just thank you that in a time of worship like this, we can lay those things before you and trust you with them. So God, we ask that you continue to do way more than we expect, way more than we imagine, way more than we dream of. Draw us close to you today. Thank you for these moments of worship where we sense your presence. And so once again, we give you this time and we do it in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, we're going to, before you greet one another, we're going to have you sit down just for a second. Uh, many of you know that my wife and I have been on vacation. We started with a pastor's conference. I actually left my wife in Missouri Valley, and Mike and I went out to Colorado and had some fun in Colorado. And then I came back through Iowa, picked up my wife. We jumped in the family van, headed out to Florida. So if you called me and I didn't call you back, that's why. Um, we took two weeks of vacation. We were able to celebrate 30 years for our wedding anniversary, and we had a blast out in Florida. Thank you, thank you. We, uh, we came back, we were planning to be in church today. We um, told our leadership team that we were just gonna kinda sit and just kinda just become a part of it again. Uh, but we get to do something special today, and you know, when, when churches go through transitions and changes, it's still neat to see God bringing new families back into the church. People that are saying, hey, we know this church isn't perfect, but we want to be a part of it. And so today, I'm going to invite Peter to come forward. And uh, I'm going to invite our elder team in just a few minutes to come up here. You can come on up now, guys. But Peter has been patient. Right, Peter? Yes. You've been patient with us. Uh, anybody that knows Peter's story... He, he's been a part of the church for a little while, and there's been a lot that's happened. And Peter, this last year, we get to finish up one year of being in our residency program in the church. And Peter, even after one year of residency, has decided to take this step and become a member of our church. And so we're so grateful and thankful for Peter 
and the way God has worked in his life. If you don't know this, Peter had kind of a tough year. He had a pretty serious accident, truck accident. And uh, we, uh, we prayed for him, but we are so thankful that he's standing before us today, that God is continuing to work in his life. And we're excited to see where God is going to take this relationship in the future. So today we're going to welcome Peter. We will make it official with a certificate, and we will hand that to you later. But today we want to pray over you, pray for you, and welcome you to our church family. You guys can clap right now because this is worth clapping about. I think this is said often. It started with Gary, one of our senior elders, and then uh, I think it's said often in our elders' meetings that you, you get to pick the person you marry, okay, but you don't get to pick their family. You don't really get to pick the family you're born into, but when you choose to become a part of a church, you get to pick that family. And so we're, we're so glad that you've chosen to pick us and that you're a part of our church. So, Dean, I'm going to ask you to pray for our brother Peter today, and I'll hand you the mic. Lord, thank you for uh, today. Thank you for bringing Peter to us, Lord. Uh, we love Peter, Lord. Uh, we love uh, his ministry that he'll bring to us, whatever that will be. Uh, you know, Lord, and uh, you will speak to Peter that. Uh, but we're thankful uh, that you bring uh, these people and families to our church so we get to share in, in ministry and worship and minister to each other, Lord, in your name. And uh, we're just so thankful that Peter uh, made that decision uh, to be a part of this community and that uh, he be a part of this outreach to our community um, and uh, be able to minister to those uh, in need, to give knowledge to those, um, and uh, to bring your word um, amongst the, the family, Lord. Uh, but we give you this day, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right, let's clap one more time. Yeah. Welcome, Peter, to Grace Community Fellowship Church. Now we're going to invite you all to stand, greet one another today. We're so glad you're here. And immediately following this time, the kids will be dismissed for upstairs.
move to our seats. That would be most helpful. I want to thank everyone for being here today. It's awesome to see a full church again, even though it's a little, some would call it dreary outside. I prefer liquid army sunshine, but either way, it's, it's wet. And I'm just so glad that we're all able to make this a priority and be here today as we worship God and we, we look into His Word. So I want to start off with prayer. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for this ability to come together as a church, brothers and sisters in Christ. We thank you for your son Jesus and for all that he's done for us, for the forgiveness of sins and the continued work he does within us with the Holy Spirit as he continues to, to change us and to bring us more like Christ. And Lord, we just pray that right now your Holy Spirit would be in this building, in this room, that it would guide the words that I say, and it would also open our ears, soften our hearts, and convict our beings of, of what you have to speak to us. So Lord, just be with us right now as we continue to worship your name and continue to study your word. And we pray this in the powerful name of Jesus, our Savior. Amen. Amen. So once again, I'm Mike. I'm one of the residents, third year resident here at Grace. And uh, usually we do more of expository preaching, but today we're, we're going through the, the series on the core values of the CMA. And so we have this, this setup, so it's a little more casual and it's kind, of, it's kind of awkward to start with. It feels like I'm at, at Sears at Glamour Shots getting me for my, my picture, but I'll quickly, quickly adjust to it. It's good to use. It's just kind of difficult at start. So we, we're going through the, uh, the core values of the CMA. There are seven core values, and this will be the fifth we're going to go over. Let's see if we can remember what they were. Everyone remember them? The first one is... I, was, I figured you're reading off the screen. Yes, lost people. Lost people matter to God, and He wants them found. Yep. You can go ahead and, and put those on. The second one, prayer. Right, prayer is the primary purpose of God's people. The third thing we learned is that the Word of God. We learned that I have to look them up sometimes too. Knowing and obeying God's Word is fundamental to all true success. I should remember that one. I preached it, but that one is one I always get stuck on. And then last week, uh, Hank gave us the one on the empowerment of the Holy Spirit. And without the Holy Spirit's empowerment, we can accomplish nothing. Only through his help can we do anything of good. So today we're going to look at, at the fifth one. And today we're looking at something near and dear to, to our hearts, and that's the Great Commission. In the Great Commission one, it says that completing the Great Commission will require the mobilization of every fully devoted disciple. And that comes out of Matthew 28, 19. Let me read that real quick. Excuse me. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Well, I want us to, to understand this idea of the Great Commission because it's, that's a, a really powerful value there that we're going to mobilize all the people to make this um, actually work. And so I start off with, do you know why we would even call it a Great Commission? It's not... It's not in the original written scripture, but we put a subtitle, we put a heading in there that said this is, this is the Great Commission. And it's not just found here in Matthew, it's found in, in other parts as well. Uh, maybe not written the exact same way, but it's great because it's of, of ultimate importance, of highest value. And we, we must not forget the, the value of the Great Commission. The other part of it is it's a commission, which means it's an order, it's a duty. It's something that, that there is an expectation of fulfillment. When I was a soldier, we would get these things all the time. We called them orders. They were directives. They were commissions. And it may be something as simple as, hey, we're going to go take that bridge out. We'd be like, yay! How? Because there has to be a, a, a way that we're going to do this. And so in Matthew, when Jesus gives the Great Commission, he not only tells us what we're going to do, but he tells us how he wants it to be done the things we're going to accomplish in his name. Let's look at, at Matthew. We're going to go one verse before and one verse after. This is the amplified version, Matthew 28, 18 through 20. It says this, Jesus came up and said to them, all authority, which is all power of absolute rule in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, 
Help the people to learn of me, believe in me, and obey my words, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to, to observe everything that I have commanded to you. And lo, I am with you always, remaining with you perpetually, regardless of circumstances on every occasion, even to the end of age. Amen. So Jesus gives us this commission, this directive, and as a CMA, we value this directive. And I want to let you know, inside of this, this, this passage, there's, there's four verbs, four things that happen. One of them is primary, and the three of them are, are just how it happens. Going isn't the primary directive. Because if we were to go and nothing happened, then why would we leave? Baptizing is important, but it isn't the sole purpose of why we go. And in the same light, teaching is only of importance if it leads to something. So there's one, there's one key verb in here that dictates everything we're going to do. And that is to make. We're going to make disciples. If I was to tell you I was to build a house, I would say, well, we're going to build a house, and we're going to buy lumber, and we're going to cut boards, and we're going to frame a wall. Framing wasn't the most important piece, nor was buying lumber. They had to happen, but it's all part of building a house. This is about making disciples. So the first thing we want to look at as we understand the Great Commission is we're going to make disciples. Last week, we had a rose that was placed on the keyboard and we forgot to mention it. But because we forgot it last week, I get to talk about it this week. So this rose represents a decision for Christ. Christ. This rose means that someone gave their life to Jesus. In this case, a good friend of mine, Marlon, led his granddaughter to Christ. And I think that's something worth applauding also. We, we, know, we know we're not applauding Marlon. We're thankful for what he does, but we know we're, we're praising God. Because that's, that's where it came from. But when, when Marlon evangelized, he didn't just say, here's the gospel, say a prayer, we're good to go, I'm out. And it's not because they're related, but because Marlon is making disciples. Marlon is invested in that person. He is talking to them. He is reading scripture with them. He is teaching. He's bringing her to church. Because discipleship is much more than evangelism. Discipleship is this ongoing process where we help each other become more like Christ. And that's what making disciples is about. See, Jesus desires this from all of his followers, that, that we make disciples because disciples make disciples make disciples. And I can go on and on and on. That's, that's the purpose of the Great Commission. We're supposed to make disciples so that they also will make disciples, and we will exponentially grow. John 14, 12 says this, Truly, truly, I say to you, whoever believes in me will also do the works that I do, and greater works than these that he will do, because I am going to the Father. You see, Jesus, fully God and fully man. But because he chose to be fully man, he could only impact those around him directly. And it wasn't Jesus' plan to convert everyone before he went to the cross. His plan was much more revolutionary than that. His plan was to take 12 men and turn those 12 men into 72. And turn those 72 into hundreds. And pretty soon where we're at today, the plan was to make disciples. Because when we impact one person then they impact one person, magic. And they impact one person. We grow much faster than Jesus was capable of doing in his physical body. Now, it's the Holy Spirit that moves around and makes all of these things happen. He's, he's the one that actually convicts people and brings them to Christ. But it's our duty to be the hands and feet of Jesus and make those connections, and continue on in discipleship. 
C.S. Lewis was a, uh, a famous author, and uh, he had this to say, speaking about the church, which is not a building, but it's us, it's believers. He said this, the church exists for nothing else but to draw men into Christ, making them little Christs. If they're not doing that, all the cathedrals, the clergy, the missions, the sermons, even the Bible itself are simply a waste of time. God became man for no other purpose. God didn't become man so we could have a fancy building. God didn't become man so we could have people in robes and, and titles. God became man so man would choose to become more like God. Luke 24, 46 through 47 says this, and this is Jesus speaking. And he said to them, Thus it is written that the Christ should suffer on the third day and rise from the dead, and that repentance for forgiveness of sins should be proclaimed in his name to all nations, beginning from Jerusalem. That's the gospel we proclaim. Jesus died for our sins. We just have to accept him as Lord and Savior. And that's supposed to begin in Jerusalem and spread out. Now for us, I'm not suggesting that we're going to move to that peninsula and start our missions work there because our Jerusalem, I would, I would say, is here in this town. Where you are is where it starts. Where you are should always be where it starts. But then we have the opportunity to go, which is the second verb. And for go, let's look at Acts chapter 1, verse 8. This should be a very, very familiar um, piece of passage to you. Acts 1, 8 says, But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my witness in Jerusalem and in Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. My favorite part of that passage. Three little words. You will be. Not, if it's convenient. Not, hey, if you got time. Jesus says, you will be my witness. That's what we're called to do. Sometimes we're called to go. Have you ever felt the urge to go? Well, sorry, I said that wrong. <laughs> it's okay, I purposely did that. Um, but in all honesty, sometimes we feel that, that pull in our heart. Sometimes we say to ourselves, you know what? I started here in the middle of Iowa, but I feel the urge to be somewhere else. I feel this, this draw that God has called me to be some other place than right here for his purpose. Sometimes it's a place like Guatemala. Sometimes it's a place like Taiwan. Sometimes it's a place like somewhere in Nebraska. We don't know. God has called each of us to different locations for different purposes. When we're called to go, our response is to follow, to go where he takes us. Mark 6, 7 through 13 says that Jesus sent out 12 apostles. And later on, this one comes from Luke, chapter 10, verses 1 through 2, Jesus sent out even more. And it says this, it says, After this the Lord appointed 72 others and sent them on ahead of him, two by two, into every town and place where he himself was about to go. And he said to them, The harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Therefore pray earnestly to the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest. Jesus started with those 12 men, and then he went to 72 men, and it was always this, the same purpose. He sent them out, not individually, where they would potentially fail underneath their, their own struggles and own tries, but he sent them out in, in groups so that they could hold each other up and they can support each other, and they can go out and they could spread the word of God. They could be the witness. And Jesus didn't plan on stopping with those 72. There are about 100 people in this room today. We are part of those 72. We are the next group that God has already said that you're going to go and be my witness. Not only are we supposed to go in order to make disciples, but we're supposed to baptize. And I don't want to spend a whole lot of time on this because I guarantee you there's at least two or three sermons just on baptism itself so we don't want to lose sight and and go too far down the rabbit trail as they would say 
But I know this. I know that just five weeks ago, I believe, five weeks ago, we baptized five people. And I know that in just a few weeks on November 7th, we're going to baptize some more. We're going to proclaim that we are followers in Jesus. Now, I got this out of, uh, it's called the Blue Letter Bible. It's, a, it's an online app, app that's a strong concordance. And it says this about baptism. Humor me. It says this. It says, Christian baptism follows the faith in the Lord Jesus. It's also to be associated with his name, which was invoked by the person baptized. It signified the remission of washing away of sins, sometimes preceded and sometimes followed by the receiving of the Holy Spirit. This is my favorite part. This word should not be confused with bapto. The clearest example of that shows the meaning of baptize is a text from the Greek poet, a, a physician named um, Nicander, who lived about 200 B.C. It's a recipe for making pickles. Not my words. I know, it's really elegant how he does this. It's helpful because he uses both of these words. Nicander says that in order to make a pickle, the vegetable should be dipped, or bapto, in boiling water. And then it is baptized, baptizo, in the vinegar solution. Both verbs concern the dipping of a vegetable in a solution. The first is only temporary. The second, baptism. The act of, bapt of baptizing the vegetable produces a permanent change. I know, it's not very elegant, but it makes sense. And when we baptize, there's some great things that happen. First, is that it's not a pastor that has to baptize a person. Because it didn't say in that verse from Matthew that you will bring them to the clergy and someone with a title will baptize. No, it says go. It says baptize. So five weeks ago, and before that, every other baptism I've been to through this church, I've watched leaders, I've watched fathers, I've watched mothers, I've watched friends baptizing one another. Because it's scriptural. We're all supposed to be part of this. And the other thing is that, that we don't take this lightly. We don't just say, hey, if you want to come up and be baptized, let's just do this right now. We want to ensure that when a person is baptized, they understand what it means. They understand what they're proclaiming. We want to take the opportunity to make sure that they know that they are making an announcement that they follow God, that they are following Jesus. So November 7th, we're going to have another baptism. And before that, October 31st, we're going to have a class. If there's anyone here who hasn't been baptized and you want to make that proclamation, I invite you to, uh, to get with one of the pastors or the elders. You can find myself and we're going to um, get you involved in that class so we can make sure that you know what baptism is all about. Because that's part of making disciples. Before the baptism, though, there's something even more important. That's to accept Jesus as your Lord and Savior. If we don't have that, then we don't need any of the rest of it. Right? Through everything we've read so far, we know that Jesus died for our sins. We know that we are sinners and that it, we are separated from God. But through the blood of Jesus alone, we have atonement. We have the propitiation of the perfect lamb who died for our sins. And if we are willing to proclaim him as Lord, if we're willing to repent of our sins and name him our Lord and Savior, then we get, we get these promises. We get the salvation that we seek only through his name. And once we accept Jesus, which is the first part of making a disciple, then we go into the discipleship. We go into what they call sanctification. We start to, to grow and learn. Disciples, making disciples, making disciples. The last verse, or last verb here is to teach. And not just what I'm doing right here. Hopefully, hopefully you're getting something out of the message I have, but it's not about this as much. Let's look at Ephesians 4, 11 and 12. It says, And he gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the shepherds, and teachers. Why? To equip saints for the work of ministry, for building up the body of Christ. 
don't be confused. When it says saints, we're not referring to someone who has been publicly named by a denomination as someone special. A saint is every person in this room who believes in Jesus. We are considered the saints. And the saints are supposed to build up the body of Christ. It's not Pastor Brad's job. It's not my job on staff. It's not the elder's job to do all of the work of the ministry. They are in ministry. We all are part of ministry, but we're not alone in the ministry. See, his job is to equip the saints, to equip us. When I come up here to preach, my job is to equip us so that when we walk out the doors, we're better prepared to do what God's called us to do as part of the Great Commission. Francis Chan is an author, um, and he wrote this. The book's called Multiply because it's about making disciples who make disciples who make disciples. And Francis Chan wrote this in his book. He says, It's incredibly simple in the sense that it doesn't require a degree, an ordination process, or some sort of hierarchical status. It's as simple as going to people, encouraging them to follow Jesus. That's pretty crazy. That's, that's really easy to do. It doesn't require the degree. It doesn't require the title. It doesn't require any special training. It requires you to accept Jesus and you to be discipled so you can go tell someone else about Jesus and they can be discipled. Now that we've kind of talked about what it is to be or to have the Great Commission, I think we need to look more into the statement of what we believe is the CMA. Right, it says that completing the Great Commission will require the mobilization of every fully devoted disciple. One friend I have is a guy by the name of Mark Young. That's his picture on the screen. Uh, you may have met him about two years ago, I believe. He was here. Uh, he's a missionary from the Philippines. And while Brad and I were at the pastor's retreat, we got to spend a, a lot of quality time with Mark as we were exploring through the uh, Rocky Mountain National Forest. And... Uh, Mark was with us, and we got to spend a couple hours with him, and I really got to know him and consider him a friend of mine. Mark is part of the CMA. He's part of our district. Our district is about five states, about 65 churches, and about 40 people who are international workers. That's a lot of people. Mark, like I say, he's in the, the city of Manila in the Philippines, the fourth largest city in the world, and he works in one of the poorest slums in all of Manila. He's from Lincoln, Nebraska. He was a pastor in Lincoln, and, and one day they went on a, on a missions trip, and he said, God's called me. I'm going to take my family and go to the Philippines, and I'm going to preach the gospel to the poorest of the poor. He tells us that the, the slum, and he uses that term, not, not I, but the slum that he works out of, police won't go into. People won't go into. They actually basically barricade around this slum and people stay out of it. Yet Mark, who's just as white as I am, who's just as middle, Midwestern as I am, has built relationships inside of this slum in the middle of Manila. He teaches at a school for those that can't afford to go. If they finish school, he go, they go into college. And the entire time the gospel is preached. That's his mission field. Now, the thing about Mark is that he's currently not in the, mil in, in the Philippines. Mark was sent home for his uh, sabbatical, for his time off, and then things like COVID hit. And currently Mark is living in Florida. And he is every day in prayer that he's going to get back to the Philippines because he's not called to be in Florida. He wasn't called to be in Lincoln, Nebraska. He's called to be in Manila. And one of the things that, that Mark is trying to do is to get his stuff moved into Florida so he can stay in his residence until God allows him to get back into Manila. And I'm sure we'll have a little bit on that later of, of how we can assist Mark. But that's one face of the Great Commission. I want us to remember that. That's one person that said, you know what? God has asked me to not be comfortable. God has asked me to not just let things pass by. God has asked me to go. 
to make disciples, to baptize, and to teach. But not just Mark. There's other people as well. This guy here is Chris Odell. Chris isn't part of our district, but he's a Midwesterner like the rest of us. Up in Minnesota. Minnesota, however they pronounce it. And this young man, a friend of ours, lives in Taipei, Taiwan. Big city again. Out of all the places in the world, he's in Taiwan and he has a coffee shop. It's a place called Aroma. But it's not a coffee shop. Aroma is the place where Chris and his family and his team share the gospel of Jesus with others. Aroma is where they are able to meet one-on-one with people over food and coffee and talk about Jesus. And this is a picture of Chris. I took it off his website. This is him actually working with, uh, with one of the local individuals. Once again, Chris wasn't from Taiwan. Chris wasn't born there. He didn't have any, I think, secular desire to move there, but he felt the tug on his heart. He said, you know what? God's called me to go somewhere. I don't know why. I don't know how, but I'm going. I'm going to go. I'm going to make disciples. I'm going to baptize. I'm going to teach. The crazy thing is that uh, we as a church, Grace Community Fellowship, we consider ourselves an Acts 1-8 church, right? And we practice that by sending people overseas. Sometimes we go over to Taiwan, or we have in the past. We're going to pray that God's going to open those doors back up again after COVID, after the political issues they may have. But right now, we've been to Taiwan, and we've, we've gone, and several groups have been there. My wife my daughter have both been there, and they met Chris Odell, some guy out of middle of nowhere, United States, who has a coffee shop in the middle of everywhere Taipei, hardest place to, pu- hardest place to find on the map. And they got to know each other, and we work with and partner with this aroma. But not all of us are going to be called to go all the way across the globe. Not all of us are going to be called to even go to California or New York, Florida. Some of us are going to be called to be a whole lot closer. If we remember Acts 1.8, it says that we're to be the witness in Jerusalem. And then Judea. And Samaria. And then the ends of the earth. If we were to put it in local terms, we're supposed to be in Mill Valley. We're supposed to be in Denison and, and Council Bluffs. We're supposed to be in Iowa, Nebraska, Missouri. We're supposed to be in the U.S. We're supposed to be all over the world. But it starts here. And then it moves near. And then it goes there. And then it spreads everywhere. So for all of us, it's not always that we're going to go overseas like Chris or like Mark before him. But we still get to be part of the Great Commission. So Chris O'Dell has this place called Aroma. It's a place in Taipei. And through through circumstances that neither my wife nor I could have ever orchestrated, she's already been to, to Taiwan. We have our own Aroma, our own facility that's a bakery but it's it's not a bakery we're building a place where jesus will be proclaimed we're building a place where people can meet for discipleship there'll be food because that's what we do but food is only the way we get people in the door food is is that great common thing that people hold that everyone gathers around a table for doesn't matter your culture you will if you eat you get together you eat And we're using that almost exactly as Chris is going to use it. Of course, we're not teaching English or any of those things, but aroma in Woodbine will be like aroma in Taipei. And not only will there be aroma in Woodbine, but aroma will also be in Missouri Valley as we look at putting a a coffee shop in here. And it won't won't be my business. It'll be the church because aroma 
isn't about the business. Aroma is in the business of making disciples, to make disciples, to make disciples. Here's why it's important. Matthew 24, 14 says this. And this gospel of the kingdom will be proclaimed throughout the whole world as a testimony to all nations, and then the end will come. I'm not here to, to uh, give a prophecy on what day I think that the end's going to come. I'm not here to start the debate on when Jesus will return triumphantly. But I am going to tell you this. Every day, mathematically, we are one day closer to it happening. doesn't matter when it is. Every day we're one day closer. And in this scripture, I see that the, it'll be preached to all the nations. What I don't see, it's going to be preached to every person. You could make an argument that right now all the nations have been preached to. You could make an argument right now that that block's already been checked. So now it's not a question of if we're going to reach the nations, but it's a question of who hasn't been reached and how can we make sure that person gets the gospel of Jesus Christ. Because at any time, we don't know when it's going to happen. Jesus will return. And at that point, there's nothing that we're going to be able to do to impact it. Jesus said that the gospel was to be proclaimed to the nations. Jesus gave us the great commission to do so. So maybe we're not called to go overseas. Maybe we're not called to even start a bakery. Maybe we're called to work where we work right now because I believe that there's a purpose for all of us. Whether you're a plumber whether you're construction, whether you're administrative, whether you work in a school, you have a purpose. But that does not take away from the Great Commission. That does not take away from our calling to share the gospel with others. So whether you're a butcher, a baker, or a candlestick maker, you still have that opportunity to share Jesus. You still have that opportunity to, to make disciples. You may be in a place where you can't do it at work, but you're not at work 24 hours a day. Our calling doesn't go away. God's request for us, His commissioning to us, is that we're supposed to share the gospel. We're supposed to make disciples. And I think that sometimes we get trapped into, well, yeah, but I install windows. I know a guy who installs windows. Yeah. And I know that when he's not installing windows, he's preaching the Word of God. And when he takes vacations he goes overseas and preaches the word of god and the best part is when he's installing windows he's either worshiping or he's proclaiming jesus to those who will listen to him it doesn't matter what we do it doesn't matter where we work it doesn't matter where we think we're supposed to be we have this calling and if we have this calling there's a chance we're going to be told to go because we're supposed to make disciples we're supposed to baptize each other. And we're supposed to teach the Word of God. I have one last... Well, I have a, I have a couple of, of applications here, and then I have one last quote for us. So, here's, here's, the, here's the takeaways. Three easy questions. Number one, where has God called me? Sometimes you may say, you know what, I'm called to, to go to seminary, or I'm called to go to China or I'm called to wherever and sometimes it's God's called me to be a witness in my hometown but you need to know where God's called you to go and the next question is am I actually willing to go where he leads am I willing to follow where Jesus takes me am I willing to actually follow the great commission because the third question is Am I actually prepared to make disciples? Remember, it's not an easy check the block one and done. I have a friend named Matt who I talk about a lot. He's from Kentucky and uh, lives in Kentucky. And uh, I shared the gospel with him for many months, and he re finally received Christ uh, about two years ago. But I didn't stop talking to him. This morning at 8 o'clock, 
as I was trying to remember what I was going to do for my sermon today and things were hectic, I got a couple of phone calls from Matt. And he's been struggling. And he says, you know what, Mike? I don't like you right now. I said, I can handle that. Why don't you like me? He said, because you keep harping on me and keep talking to me about God and I'm going to church today. Amen. So we have to remember that discipleship isn't this instant quick fix. Our world tells us that things should happen instantaneously and that we should have instant gratification. Salvation may be instant. Discipleship isn't. Are you ready to make disciples? One last quote. Once again, this is from Francis Chan. He says this. He says, The call to be a disciple of Jesus Christ is open to everyone, but we don't get to write our own job description. If Jesus is Lord, then he sets the agenda. If Jesus Christ is Lord, then your life belongs to him. He has a plan, agenda, and calling for you. You don't get to tell him what you're going to do today or for the rest of your life. I want you to think about that, and I want you to pray about that. And let's pray right now. Lord Jesus, we, we come to your feet today. We lay down all of our issues before you, our sins, our hurts, just the things that are in the way of our relationship with you, Lord. We thank you for your word. We thank you for your Holy Spirit that will take that word and change our hearts, Lord. We ask that you would speak to us on your plan for us, that you would reveal to us where our mission field is, each and every person. We ask that you would give us the strength to accept the challenge you've laid before us and that you would guide us as we continue to proclaim your name to the nations, Lord, as you have asked us to do. Lord, be with us through the rest of this service as we continue to lift your name on high, as we continue to worship you, as we continue to honor you in your name. And Lord, we ask that we would continue to also do this once we walk out these doors into the mission field that we would be willing to share the gospel with others and to help them become disciples of you, Lord. And we ask this in the name of Jesus, our Savior. Amen.